Okay. Right, good. So, welcome to the first lecture of Rakunska Zachtevos, Computational Complexity. Um, as we established beforehand, there are non Slavian speakers in the room. So, I'm going to give the lectures in English. But if you would like some explanation in Slovene, please ask me, or I should try to speak slowly and clearly in English, but if I get excited or something and start to, um, start to run away with myself, then please slow me down and you can also ask me to explain things in Slovene if you'd like that. Um, and then you probably prefer the original English explanation afterwards when you've heard my attempt to, to say, say things in Slovene. So the way it's going to work, um, I mean, obviously this is exceptional circumstances this year, but less exceptional than, um, than in previous years, where the, the last year where we had the fully online teaching. Um, but this is now a different, a different model. We're teaching in the classroom, but at the same time, we're trying to make as many materials available as possible for people to follow the course online. So. What I'm going to start doing, but we'll see how it works and we can adapt if appropriate. I'm going to start by recording lectures and putting the recordings on the on available, making them available from the course web page. Now the recording is going to have me and the whiteboard, but unfortunately I've just been practicing this a bit of reflection off the whiteboard that I don't think I can do anything about. Um, so you're not going to see the, the whiteboard very well on the recordings. So what I shall also do is I shall um, take photos of the whiteboards when they're full before erasing them, and I'll put photos of the whiteboards online along with the recordings. Another option potentially for the future is to move to me teaching on the tablet with projecting, but I prefer the, I mean, personally, I prefer the dynamics of the board so we'll see how it goes um, with the board. I Just, think uh, doing something with the blinds probably helps with the rear. Um, so the blinds in the window. So the, the reflection seems to be from this side here. The, the main problem is this side here is the corridor. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I can do anything about that. I was trying to see before. <laughs> It might be possible to switch that up. I don't know this will be very well. I don't see any lights. If one of you would like to, to uh, have a look, then please, please do. Um, but anyway, the, you, you will see what the recording looks like if you have a, have a look at it. Um, anyway, somehow the, the recording is meant as a backup, and it's much better to be here in person um, if, if possible. Right, so as you know, um, lectures, you're here, so uh, uh, Monday is 8 to 11. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about how the course is going to be organized. But actually, the officially, if you look at the um, course plans, it's not three hours of lectures, although that's what's timetabled, it's two hours of lectures and one hour of seminar. And I'm going to be a little bit um, relaxed about this, whether it's lectures or seminar, but in general, I'm going to aim to do two hours of lectures. Plus one hour, let's call Call it seminar, but one hour of something um, a bit different. And I'll say what one of those things is going to be um, in a moment when we come to course assessment. And then there's the exercise classes via uh, exercise Excel Fridays from one o'clock to three o'clock, I think. I've got that right. And I'm sorry for anyone who showed up last week. I did put an announcement on the um, let no chill that's a page for the course but I, I think some people missed it so I'm, i apologize for that um, but the exercises start this week um following the, the first lecture so the way i'm going to assess the course is 
Um, so the, the, the material is quite mathematical. Oh, it's a, math, a mathematics course, but it's quite technical. And it's, it's hard to, to write nice, short exam questions for um, computational complexity. So what we've decided to do is we're not going to have a written exam for, for this course. So instead, the assessment um, is going to be, as usual, divided into a kind of practical and theory part. Um, but actually, not all the practical part is going to be to do with the buyer. So 20% of the practical part of the assessment is going to be presentations by you in um, on material from the course. And this is going to be one of the ways we're going to use the, the one hour seminar slot. So we're going to have 20%. So everybody is going to have to give one presentation. And presentations will be sort of 20 minutes or something like that. And I might allow you to work in pairs as well. So, so then, I mean, then it would be a longer presentation with two of you sharing the presentation. But we'll have a number of topics on the course, for example, going through a particular proof in some detail, or something like that, which, which would be an appropriate topic, or read or some reading related to the course, but not directly part of the course. So we'll have this sort of topic that will be um, for student presentations, and this will fill some of the seminar slots. So we're not going to start on this straight away. This will be more, I, I don't know, probably starting in November or something like that. Um, maybe from next week, I'll put a timetable online that you can sign up for when you would like to with with a rough idea of what the topics will be. I mean, they won't mean very much to you at this stage, but it's a, one, a rough idea of what the topics will be, and then you can sign up for the presentation. And each presentation will be 20% of the course. You can present in English or in Slovenian. So don't worry if you prefer to present in Slovenian, that's fine. Um, and 30% on the practical side is going to be on a homework. So some homework exercise. And this will be a fairly, I mean, 30% of the course is going to be a fairly substantial exercise that will be divided into um, parts. So there'll be an easier part and a uh, more, more challenging part. And um, this is going to, this will be in December and January. So end of December, early January. And then 50%, remaining 50% is going to be a theoretical oral, oral exams. So the usual theoretical components. And um, so I think we'll give you about three weeks to do, to do this homework. And it's that period for doing the homework will include the Christmas, whole of the Christmas and New Year within, within, within that period. And so as part of that, um, the, the lecture timetable, we're not, we're going to follow the timetable, but we're not going to have any teaching the week of the 20th, the, starts on Monday the 27th of December till the Friday the 31st of January. So I don't know if you've looked at the, um, I'll just try to, anyway, but if you, sorry? Uh, yeah, the, so, so as far as I can see, those five days are all supposed to be teaching days, the 27th, of, but uh, I, what, what we've decided to do on this course is because you're going to have a homework at that point, it seems appropriate rather than having lectures and exercise classes, we will offer optional consultations to help to provide assistance with the homework. So, so no teaching. Well, there is teaching, but it's consultation. By teaching here, I mean no lectures and exercises class, 
no lectures or exercise classes, so no teaching the um, 27th to 31st December. So instead, consultations. Optional. You don't need to have a consultation on the homework if you don't want to. But the opportunity will be there for you to make use of it if you want to. So instead, consultations optional um, on, on the homework. Okay, it's just about. Oh. So I've never done, I'm, I'm actually, one thing I forgot to say, I'm also going to run the lectures on Zoom, or at least I was intending to and record via Zoom. So at the moment I'm recording via Zoom, um, but I hadn't realized it's, the camera is working as a mirror rather than, rather, rather than presenting it like, so, so everything's in mirror writing. Um, I wonder if I can, did you think I can change it while I'm? Um, yes, can I? I think you just need to click options. Oh, um, should, should I pause the recording first? Um, I don't think you need to, or, or if you want to. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, so, I think you need to. Settings, and I think it's about 90. 90. Oh, that's just rotating. Yeah, that's not gonna. Is there a mirror? I think um, down there should be a mirror option. I think. Uh, if you scroll down. So this is the sort of thing. I mean, oh, all right, mirror my video. There it is. Yeah, yeah excellent. Thanks. Um, right. Okay. So. Um, yeah. So I think that's everything I wanted to say about course organization. Are there any questions on this? No? Okay. Um, and it seems that I may use this part of the book. Obviously, this part's more visible to you um, because this is the screen here, but the problem is the camera only gets to here. So I'm, I'm going to I'm going to try to be on the left hand side as much as possible. Let's draw this right line here, please. Okay. Um, so today. The first lecture, so I don't want to go into anything too technical to begin with. I want to begin more with motivation. Um, there's this divide that I want to try to maintain of the two hours lecture and one hour seminar. So I thought today for the seminar, what I'd like to do is give you a link to a video, and the seminar will be that you watch a video. That I mean, I was thinking of running it on the screen with the speakers, but I actually think it would be more comfortable for you to watch it in your own time if I, if I, if I just put a, a link there. So we will probably finish early today, and then I'll put a link on the web page to a video of somebody presenting material related to the course that I'll talk about um, when we get to it. So, so the lecture is going to hopefully finish quite early. Um, and in the remaining time of the two hours that are uh, the lecture part, I, I want to motivate the course material and just give some of the basic definitions, but some of which I've probably seen before. Um, So the course is uh, computational complexity, and probably most of you have some idea of what that means. Essentially, the key issue is studying and understanding how hard it is to solve certain problems algorithmically on a computer. So it's very useful in 
it's used all the time in everyday life. Computers are used for solving problems. And um, some problems are easy to solve on the computer. Some problems look hard, but you can be very clever and come up with extremely ingenious algorithms that enable you to solve them effectively. So it turns out that those problems are easier than they look at first sight. Other problems sometimes look innocuous, that's kind of harmless, but then when you think about it more, you realize actually it's not so easy to solve them. And in fact, we don't even have good ways of, of so we don't know good ways of solving such problems. And other problems, we can prove are definitely very, very hard. So there's sort of all sorts of different classes of problems one gets, some of which are easy to compute, some of which are difficult to compute, some of which we're not quite sure how easy or difficult they are. And computational complexity is going to be some, somehow understanding this territory, this landscape of different problems and how difficult they are. So I, I want to begin by looking at a list of computational problems and thinking about how hard it is to solve such problems. So actually, I'm going to do most of the work in this part of the board, um, but the list, the list, it doesn't matter if it's off the video, the list down right down here on the right. I realized I said I was going to take photos of the, of the board um, to put on the to, to put on the web page. I actually forgot that for the course organization. So maybe I'll just put that information separately on the course web page. In future, if I start to rub off the board and I haven't taken a photo, um, please remind me. I mean, I'll try to remind myself. Um, okay, but what I want to look at is a list of uh, problems, computational problems, and think about how difficult it is to write an algorithm or a computer program to solve the problem. Um, the first one I'm going to look at is calculating the determinant of an n by n matrix. So as you know, the determinant is an important mathematical concept in linear algebra. Um, useful in lots of fields, such as um, geometry, uh, well, and so many, this is useful in so many places, I don't need to start enumerating um, where. If you've got an N by N matrix, there's a simple formula for it. So how can we calculate on a computer the determinant? So let's have a look at that. It's a useful thing to do. So if we've got uh, an n by n matrix, then probably know that the determinant, if we wanted to write a full formula for it. There's a straightforward to write formula called the Leibniz formula for the determinant, which is you consider every permutation on the indices one to n. And for every permutation, so we calculate a certain product of elements picked out by the permutation. And we sum over every permutation we sum those products together, weighting them by an appropriate sign, either one or minus one. So we sum over all permutations, little sigma, permutations on the n element set of indices, one to n. So those permutations are taken from the set of permutations on one to n. That's the symmetric group um, on n elements. So we sum over all such permutations, the product, we go down the rows from one to n, 
and take the product of in every row the entry in the row i picked out by the permutation by applying sigma to i and then we weight that product by the sign of the permutation so we know the, the sign of a permutation is how many flips of how many swaps of two element things whether it whether you need an even number of swaps or an odd number of swaps of two element things in order to build up the whole permutation okay so that's the formula so we could easily write a program for that on the computer it's easy to generate the permutation i mean there are simple ways of generating all the permutations and we could go through all the permutations calculate this product in each case and calculate the sign of the permutation that's easy and sum them all up um but that would be a terribly bad thing to do if we had a large matrix and i mean i'm sure can somebody say why that would be a bad thing to do yeah, yeah, I mean, well, exactly. so the symmetric group, what's the size of the symmetric group given n? n factorial. So, so if we take, think about each time we have a permutation here, here we're multiplying n different numbers together. So that takes n minus one binary multiplications to multiply n different things together. Okay, we're multiplying by a one or minus one, but we don't really need to think of that as a multiplication because that's just flipping a sign. That's a very easy operation. So we've got n multiplication, n minus one multiplications, and we're doing that n factorial times. So we've got the additions as well. But so so if we implement this naively. We require to implement naively. This requires um, n factorial times n minus one times n minus one multiplications. And uh, factorial actually grows super exponentially, slightly super as the Stirling's formula. Tells us how fast um, how fast factorial grows, and so this is just um, not a good way of computing the determinant. But miraculously, it turns out that if you're much cleverer in how you implement the algorithm for the determinant, it can be computed much more efficiently. So there is a clever solution. I don't want to go into it in detail, but the basic idea is you use Gaussian elimination. The way the algorithm for solving simultaneous equations. And Gaussian elimination factorizes the matrix A as a product, an LUP product of a lower triangular matrix, an upper triangular matrix, and a permutation matrix. I'll just write lower triangular, upper triangular, and a permutation. And then the determinant of A, well, if it's a product of matrices, is just the determinants have the product rule. So the product of the determinant of the product, this product of the determinants. We just need to compute the determinant of this, the determinant of this, and the determinant of this, and multiply them together. But the determinant of the lower triangular matrix is just the product of all the entries on the diagonal, the same with an upper triangular matrix. In fact, if you do Gaussian elimination fully, you get 
L just has ones along the diagonal anyway, so its determinant is one. So anyway, you just basically need the determinant of U, and the determinant of the permutation is the sign of the permutation. Um, so by the time, once you've got this factorization, you just need to product elements along the diagonals. And that just takes the n elements to product together. So that just takes n minus one multiplications. So the difficulty goes into doing the Gaussian elimination. And the algorithm for Gaussian elimination, if one works it out nicely, um, this rather than growing at the rate of the factorial super exponentially, this grows with n cubed. So this main thing is this, and the complexity of this. Rows with n cubes. And here, for the first time, I'm using big O notation, which I hope most of you have met in courses on algorithms. But this is going to be fundamental to this course, measuring the rate of growth of functions. Here we're talking about the, the number of step computation steps in the function to compute the determinant of the matrix. Um, and we're going to be measuring them using this big O notation, which is an asymptotic measure of growth. So actually the technical content of today's lecture is going to be to remind you of the definition of big O and the related little O notation that we're going to use for um, talking about the rate of growth of um, functions, such as the, the time function for an algorithm. Okay, but the point is here with the determinant, we've got a, a clever algorithm, and this clever algorithm has this, this clever idea that we actually use Gaussian elimination to factorize the matrix, and that helps us compute the determinant, has allowed us to reduce what seemed like a rather intractable computation task. Intractable means very hard to realize. Um, it's actually turned it into one that's much, much more manageable. And in fact, there are other even cleverer algorithms that do the big O of n to the two point something or other. I don't remember exactly what the numbers are. So this can be, the, 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 the uh, exponent here of three can actually be improved. Right, so that's example one. Um, Example two is test given the problem of given a number, a, a, just an integer in this case, a, a positive integer. Um, can we tell whether or not the number is prime? This is a primality test. Oh, <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, I, I still haven't got used to having phones with cameras on. I mean, that's the, when I was growing up, a phone was something wired into the wall of the house. And uh, anyway, I shall. Going to have the same reflection on. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe is that okay? I'm, I'm not sure this is really COVID legitimate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's do this. Oh, and now I'm the wrong side of the screen. I'm sorry, but. Don't, don't make an official footage though. I, th I think maybe we'll just have to go with what can be seen on the computer. Um, right, so primality testing. It 
given a large number. Um, given an input n is n prime. So of course, you're going to give a large number to a computer and typically has, say, a sequence of digits in binary or base 10 or some, some appropriate number representation system. Um, and how are we going to check to see if n is prime? So again, there's a naive algorithm. And uh, well, you know, you can make the naive, the algorithm could be very naive or it could be a little bit cleverer that at least it starts by saying, well, as long as it's not two, then we will we'll reject an even number. And then once we've got a, a higher odd number, we can then go through all odd numbers, check odd numbers from three to as long as you space smaller than n squared, if it has, sorry, not n squared, square root of n. If it has some factor, it will have a factor that's less than or equal to the square root of n to see if any, and it's very easy to check if a number divides, um, if you've got some odd number i to check whether it divides n, that's very easy. So in check, check if it divides n. And this is okay. Except that again, we have a problem that if we have, say, a, a number with 100 decimal digits, then going up to the square root of that, well, that will be um, square root of that would have like 50 decimal digits. And uh, so then you're potentially checking all odd numbers from three to 10 to the power of 50, and that's going to take a very, very, very long time. So again, this is actually, that algorithm would be linear in N itself, but we're not really interested in N itself. We give N as an input to the computer as a sequence of decimal digits. So we give, so the input we give to the computer has log, if, it, if it's a base 10 notation has log to the base 10 of n digits, roughly. Um, and this algorithm is exponential in the size of the input. It's growing, the, the size of the input is the logarithm of n, and this algorithm is up to the square root of n, and that's exponential in the size of the input. Again, this is inefficient, an inefficient algorithm. So it's exponential in size. So we'll write this bar by n to mean the size of the rep of the decimal representation of the number n. So obviously it's a, it's a natural mathematical problem to check if a number is prime, but it's also a very practically useful problem because in cryptography, the keys that one generates for the various crypto systems, in particular the very famous RSA crypto system, the, the keys that one generates in cryptography are generated as products of two very large prime numbers. And in order to find the large prime numbers to multiply them together, you need to you basically generate random large, odd large numbers and need to test if they're prime. So actually, primality testing is, a, is something that's of very large numbers. 
is something that's used all the time in um, computer applications that involve security whenever you need to generate security keys. It can't be done this way. So how can it be done? So again, this is a situation that's rather like with, um, with uh, the determinant that clever algorithms help. So this time we have various clever algorithms. And they all exploit number theory. The various number theoretic tests for primality that can be used. Um, this was a very big breakthrough in computing in the 1970s when people realized how to do this. So the algorithm that most people use for testing primes um, actually involves randomness. So In order to test that a number is prime, it's a perfectly definite question. Is this fixed number that I have a representation of, is it a prime number? But, it, but the main algorithm that's used to test it allows the computer to toss a coin, and that's important for the algorithm to be, to be able to prove that the main algorithm that's used is correct. It's necessary that one models, one has an algorithm that um, so it's a particular algorithm needs to, in order to, for it to be correct, you need to understand the coin as being truly random. So um, so there is an efficient algorithm. I'm not going to talk about it now. I just want to somehow set the scene for how things are. So there is an efficient algorithm that requires randomness in the it requires a computer tossing coins so this requires randomness so this is a particular i'm not writing it very well in english this is a particular efficient algorithm from the 1970s requires randomness and then it, for a long time it was a, an open question whether or not this randomness is necessary to get to full in order to have an efficient algorithm for testing primality. Um, and a big breakthrough like 10, 10 or so years ago it's also an effective so 10 or so years ago some a group of three Indians um, stunned the world by coming up with an extremely inventive different way of testing primality that didn't involve randomness and was also efficient um, so, so let me just say so so now that there exist efficient algorithms but actually so that now there exist efficient algorithms without randomness without randomness so that's, um, let me say 2000s, but I, I don't actually remember exactly what the date was. This is the AKS algorithm. But in fact, the, the easier and the algorithm that works best in practice is still this one that does involve randomness. And one interesting thing about it is that it, because it involves randomness, it can potentially make mistakes. You can reduce the probability of a mistake to any small probability that you're prepared to live with. So the way that the story normally goes is we can, as long as we run it, so if we run it once, we'll have a probability of a half of the algorithm making a mistake. But if you run it five times, that becomes one over two to the power of five, so that would be one over 32 times. So, so, the, so the more times you run it, the more certain you are. If you run it 50 times, 
then you only, and it tells you 50 times that it's a prime number, then you only have a one over two to the power of 50 chance that it's made a mistake. And the way this used to be explained when people were coming up with these algorithms is if you run it 50 times, then there's a higher probability that a cosmic ray will come out of the sky and zap your computer and um, create some error in the memory. So you, you, whenever you run something on a computer, you, there's always a probability that something might go wrong anyway. So one over two to the power of 50 is fine to live with. Um, so let me just, before we have the break, let me just um, mention one more example because it's related to parameter testing and that is factorizing a number. I'm just going to take a picture of the board and let me think. Um, the problem of factorizing a number. Is given an n, number n, an integer n. One, one can write it in various different ways, but the, the most one could ask for is compute its prime factorization. So to compute a list of prime numbers um, with multiples where, where needed, it's the same prime number. But when you product all the primes together, we'll give the number n. Compute its prime factorization. And here there's a very, so I guess many of you will know this, is that there's a, another very intriguing situation because we've seen that. Primality testing, there are efficient algorithms. There was an efficient random algorithm, randomized algorithm from the 1970s. There's now an efficient deterministic algorithm. Um, so primality testing is efficient. So if we're given a large number, n, we can test to see if it's prime. And if it is prime, well, we've got its prime factorization, it's just one number. If it's not prime, well, I mean, then we know that it has some prime factors that are different from that number. So we can efficiently test if it's prime or not. But once we've detected that the number is composite, it turns out that actually fine, we know that a factor exists, that some that prime factors exist, but finding them turns out to be very, very difficult. Um, and as you, as you may know, it is not known how to do this efficiently. On an ordinary deterministic computer, or even a computer with randomness on a deterministic or random. So by random, I mean we allow sort of this coin tossing or random computer. So really just writing things in a short way here, but I mean a computer with randomness that we allow it to have randomness. 
But the really huge development of this area was the development was the, in, I think it was 2004, and the realization by Peter Shaw, very, very famous realization that with a quantum computer, a different kind of computer that uses um, the uses quantum physics to be able to compute in a, in a very clever way using quantum superpositions, as, it, as it's called, of um, qubits, of quantum bits. Um, then prime factorization can be computed efficiently. This is this is my famous algorithm called Shaw's algorithm after Peter Shaw. I think it was two thousand and four. And as probably many of you know, the main problem with this is that people have been now for about thirty years or so investing lots of money in trying to build quantum computers, and it's a really big industry at the moment. Um, but we do not have quantum computers of sufficient size and quality to be able to implement Shaw's algorithm. So it's theoretically, it should be possible, we hope, we think. We think the laws of physics should allow us to build computers that can run this efficient algorithm for prime factorization. Um, but still, the, the technology, is, it's a big open question, actually, how to, to address this. But from a mathematical point of view, it's rather fascinating that now we've, we've got these different computational models. So we have the computational model of deterministic computation that pretty much models what's going on on my laptop quite well. And then we have deterministic computation with randomness that was used that was useful for finality testing. And that can also be performed on my laptop because there are random randomness facilities there. There's a question how good they are, how truly random they are. That's another very interesting issue. Finality testing, the algorithm has been used on some other resource, such as randomness. Factorizing a number really needs, as far as we know, to do that efficiently really needs a different kind of computer altogether, um, a quantum computer. So, so far with these three examples, we've got um, the idea that clever algorithms can help, but also can help us compute difficult ones and mathematically challenging problems quantities efficiently, but on top of that, um, also the computational model makes a difference. So that seems a good pausing point. Um, I suggest we have a 15 minute break till 25 past, and, um, and then we'll start again at 25 past. Uh, are there any questions? I'm gonna just pause the video um, when I see how to do it. <laughs>